This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. It was 1946. The first Yom Kippur after the war. They had just finished Chris Atayra in a DP camp called Feldefink, which was a gathering of many of the broken shells. Those who had survived the terrible catastrophe and who were groping to put the shattered pieces of their lives back together again. And they had just finished Kriyas HaToyra on Yom Kippur and they received word that on that day General Eisenhower, the Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces and later the 34th President of the United States was coming to visit this DP camp. A few days earlier they had been told that Eisenhower was coming to visit and then they were told that when the general would come there would have to be a representative someone to greet the general there would have to be a speech maybe a few speeches someone who could describe their feelings someone who could get o- give over the pent up feelings the vent to vent the storm inside their souls and a dispute arose in the camps who should be appointed for this task and the Shomer Torah in the camp said there's no one in the camp who could represent us better than the Kleisenberg Rebbe Zechat Tzadik Levracha the one although he himself had lost a wife and 11 children in the war he was the one who went from one broken neshama to the next breathing life into the embers to reignite the spark of Yadus. Who could better represent us than the Rebbe? Who could better give over our feelings? Many felt only the Kleisenberger Rebbe could represent them on that fateful day. And then the more progressive ones, the more enlightened ones, the ones who had already forsaken Torah mitzvahs, they said, Him? That Rebbe? We've long forgotten about that type of Yiddishkeit. We don't want to bring that back again. It's an embarrassment to us. We want someone who could speak. Someone of today, not a man of the past. Not someone who we're ashamed of. And there was a big argument that broke out in the camp. And some people insisted, no, only the rebel could represent us. And they came to the following compromise. Okay, the Rebbe will speak first, but there are three conditions. Number one, he cannot mention the name of Hashem. Number two, he can't give any Musr. And number three, he needs to speak very briefly because we want to have the last word. We want to send some of our own representatives to speak. And so Eisenhower came, and they set up a big platform, a big stage, and the Kleisenberger Rebbe goes up to the podium to speak and to greet General Eisenhower. And just as he's going up to the podium, at the last moment, the Kleisenberger Rebbe grabs a talus. And he wraps himself in the talus, and he makes a bracha on the talus, Asher Kedeshanu B'Mitzvaysa So he managed to get in the name of Hashem. Then he greeted the general. And he thanked him and he said, we will forever be grateful to you for the part that you played in saving the lives of the last remnant of the people who were persecuted, who were handed, totally innocent of any crime. For that we thank you and we will be forever grateful. And then he turned to the people and he began to encourage them. And the Rebbe said, my dear brothers and sisters, We must never forget that we are the Am Hashem. We must never forget that we have a purpose in this world. We have a tachos in this world. To proclaim the greatness, to be Mekadeh Shem Shamayim all over the world, wherever we may go. And if HaKadosh Baruch Hu saw fit to save our lives, and we were the ones who survived, then we have to understand, and we have to realize that it was for a purpose, that we have a mission here in this world. And as he began to talk, he was tugging at the heartstrings of all those broken neshamas. And all the people began to cry. There were many there who said they had not cried in six years. They had not cried since the camps. 
The well springs of tears had long dried up, and the thousands of people who were listening were crying, rivers of tears were flowing through the crowd. Eisenhower was shaken to the core. He was visibly and profoundly moved. And all the others who had prepared speeches said, it's okay, we don't want to speak. We have nothing left to say. And Eisenhower turned to the Kleisenberger Rebbe and he said, Holy Rabbi, tell me, what is it that I could do for you? What could I do for your people? And the Kleisenberger Rebbe looks him in the eye and he says, General, today's Yom Kippur. Sukkot is in five days. That means we only have four days to get a hold of Dalad Minim. General, bring us Dalad Minim. We need a Lulav, we need an Esra, we need a Adasim and a Rabbis. That's all we ask for and that's all we need. Eisenhower cannot believe, believe what he was hearing. Who knows what this rabbi is going to ask for? And this is what he asks for, a citron, a myrtle. On that day, Eisenhower dispatched a plane to Italy to bring them back, Dalad Minim. To give over a message, to give over the feelings of Klai Yisrael, their suffering and the triumph of their survival, to give it over to Eisenhower, we needed someone at least as great as the Klosenberger Rebbe. How great do we then have to be to give over to future generations, to give over in the proper way the agony of our destruction and the glory of our continuous survival? How great must we be in order to accomplish this monumental task? You know, a recent Gallup poll revealed the following. American Jews were asked, what do you believe defines most the meaning of being Jewish? What does it mean to be a Jew? And amazingly, the answer that topped the list at 73% was remembering the Holocaust. So while on the one hand this response is quite heartwarming, that means the American Jewish community Whatever level of observance they're on, they understand instinctively that Holocaust Memorial is vital, is critical. But upon further analysis, this is a statistic which is quite demoralizing. Because while 73% of American Jews believe that being Jewish is defined by remembering the Holocaust, only 19% of American Jews said that Jewish observance was the definition of being Jewish, which puts into very sharp focus that the concept of Holocaust Memorial is possibly the most profoundly misunderstood concept that we have today. Because while 73% of Jews maintain that Holocaust Memorial is the central definition of being a Jew, Rahman al that is about the same rate as the intermarriage rate in America today. Obviously, the message of the memorial is not getting through. And to deliver the message in the proper way, it requires true Torah greatness, what to emphasize, and how to articulate it. Something that I am completely unworthy of. Hinani ha'ani mimas. But to borrow the analogy of the Chafetz Chaim, I stand before you, Kenanos al Anok, like a midget who stands on the shoulders of a giant. Because what I would like to share with you are not my own thoughts, not my own observations and experiences, but I'd like to share with you the perspective of someone who to me is a giant of spirit, majestic personality, a tzaddik, someone who is very dear and close to me, my grandfather, Hashem Yishmerei V'chayel O'Rech Yomim, Rav Mordechai Leib Gladstein Shlita. My grandfather has been a Rav in Pittsburgh since 1951. He's a survivor of all the infamous camps, Radom, Auschwitz, Dachau. And in 1945, when the American and Russian armies were approaching, and the Germans had to make a major decision, should they 
focus all their resources at the war front to try to win the war? Or should they dedicate all their abilities to exterminate whatever Jews remained in Europe? And it's well known that they chose the latter. So, 1945, they rounded up whatever Jews remained in the camps, my grandfather included, and they packed them like animals onto the cattle cars without food, without drink, where they were headed to the Tyrol Mountains to dig their own graves. I happened to chance upon a book that describes what the conditions on those cattle cars were like. And even more importantly, there was a historical treasure, something that my family was completely unaware of. The name of the book is A Brush with Death, written by Morris Wizegrad, who is an artist in the death camps. He writes as follows. There were more than 100 men stuffed into our car. It was so crowded that no one could sit. We were jammed standing. The, jo- the doors were shut immediately when the car was full. The car did not move for three hours. Finally, the train began to move. But then again, it stopped at the Gdansky terminal, standing for another hour and a half. The heat was unbearable. We started screaming through the windows, begging for water. The Ukrainians guarding us brought us water, but only in return for valuables. After receiving them, many of the guards simply splashed the water into the faces of the victims, cursing and laughing sadistically. People had to perform bodily functions right in the car. The stench became unbearable. We could not even react. I lost all sense of fear, writes Morris Wizegrad. Death was imminent. There was one rabbi on the car. Rabbi Mordechai Gladstein. About midnight, Rabbi Mordechai Gladstein called out, Jews, let us say Vidoy. We all joined him in reciting the prayers, what we thought would be our last Mm -hmm. prayers. Rabbi Gladstein and his brother somehow survived and settled in the United States. How did it happen? Well, when the American army discovered uh, the plan, Under the direction of the U.S. Air Force and Brigadier General Henry Linden, Linden, the U.S. Air Force bombed the railroad tracks and thwarted their plan. My grandfather, as Augustine, said over many times that when the SS officers realized that their end was coming to a near, they quickly exchanged uniforms with the Jewish inmates. But when the American army landed, they were not duped by this scheme The Jewish prisoners were skeletons. They were walking cadavers. And the German officers were fat. They were robust. They were chazerim. The American general, Henning Linden, handed my grandfather his pistol. He said, Rabbi, take the gun. Take revenge against your enemy. To which my grandfather responded, Revenge? I leave revenge to the Rebani Shalemah. It's been five years since I've been able to look into Masechta Baba Basra. I'm in the middle of learning Masechta Baba Basra. Now I am reunited with my Gemara. This is my freedom. I leave revenge to the Rebbein Shalalam. Upon liberation, my grandfather, because aside from being a Tamil Chachman, he was a Ben Bayis, a Ramanachim Zemba, he had smicha before the war from the Rav of Varsha, Shlomo Dabar Kahana, but he had also studied English in Poland. And when the American army liberated him, he was appointed the head of the religious department of the joint, of the joint distribution committee. And in that capacity, he was given a jeep, he was given an American army uniform, and he acted as a liaison between the survivors and the American army. And when General Eisenhower visited Feldefink, My grandfather was the one who served as Eisenhower's translator for the survivors. And when Eisenhower consented to ship the Dalad Minim to the DP camps, those Dalad Minim arrived at my grandfather's desk. And I'm very proud to say that my Zayda was the Shlucha Drachmana. He was the heavenly agent 
who personally distributed those Dalet Minim to the survivors. And what I tell you is not a legend, not just telling you something from hearsay. Be very happy to show you pictures. My grandfather distributing the Dalet Minim in Feldafing right after the war. Are they more like last thing? Please allow me to share with you the following question. Here we are. Most of the day has passed. It's the most tragic day of the year. A day we mourn all the tragedies for the Crusades, for the massacres, for the pogroms, for the Inquisition, for the Holocaust. You ever wonder if we're really and truly mourning, then why do we get off the floor in the middle of the day? What kind of avilus is that? Just a few hours at night? A few hours in the morning? And it's it? It's over? We're done? What kind of minog is this? To get up from avilus in the middle of the intense avilus in the middle of the day? That's it? One half a day? You have three weeks. You have nine days. You have shmur shachab and tishabab. And here we are! The most intense avilus! And we can't even give it a full day. What's the meaning of this minag? What's the meaning of this practice? I want to share with you an article that my grandfather wrote in a book entitled Theological and Halachic Reflections on the Holocaust. This article is a vivid first-hand account of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. My grandfather writes as follows, Ani hagever ani b'shevet avrosai I am the man who saw the affliction of my people. I am the victim and I am the witness. I saw the Warsaw Ghetto with thousands of skeletons extending their bony arms as if begging for mercy and life. I saw the Warsaw Ghetto littered with corpses, faces distorted, swollen, their eyes open wide. Skulls crushed everywhere. Blood flowing through the streets. The blood of our children, of our brothers and sisters, of our fathers and mothers. No imagination, no matter how daring, could conceive of anything that we saw and lived through. No language has ever been created to describe the enormity of the slaughter of European Jewry. My grandfather wrote an article in Dasi the Shabbat in Adar, the 5757 edition. I read you a translation. We were hauled to the forced labor camp of Bedzin. We labored there under the most brutal conditions. In the bitter winter, in the early morning darkness with freezing temperature, we were forced to perform back-breaking labor, constant whippings. What gave us the mysterious strength to survive? What gave us the endurance to live, to breathe, to carry on? If it weren't the torch of Torah, I would have been lost to my suffering. We would stand together with our dear unforgettable friends, Itchemayu Zemba, Avrum Zemba, together with Rabbanim of Varsha, Rav David Shapira, Rav Shimshin Shtakhamer, Zechrona Levracha, many other Torah scholars. It was the Shas, it was the Gemara that these Gedolim had memorized, that they knew about her. It was these conversations that served as the Ner Tamid, that served as our Chizok, as our life during those dismal nights. My grandfather writes, the aftermath of the uprising was the Gehenna of all Gehennams. On that day we saw men, women, children being led into the house of death. I shed bitter tears of despair. We suffered most when we saw the children accompanied by their mothers and fathers 
or walking alone. And then within moments, their lives were snuffed out. The yells of the women, the weeping of the children, the cries of despair and misery ring in my ear every day of my life. Kel Mekamois Hashem, Kel Mekamois Sophia. Can we dare ask the question? Why did it happen? Why did a third of American, of European Jewry, were slaughtered while the entire world stood by with their heads buried in the sand? Can we dare ask that question? And I'm not here not to ask the question and not to answer the question. But if you're looking for meaning, if you're searching for meaning, what could you take out of the Holocaust? I would like to share with you a very personal thought and a thought that intensifies in my heart every year as Tisha B'Av approaches. I want to share with you another story. My grandfather writes from Radom, we were transported to Dachau, the Eime Kabocha, the valley of weeping of the Germans, Malach Hamadas, killings every day, total humiliation in the eyes of the Germans. Throughout the years, my grandfather was together with his brother, Heinoch, Zechatag Levracha. They were throughout, in all the camps, they were together. And my dear grandfather and his brother were kicked and chased to the crematorium. They're at the doorstep of the base Hasrefa, where tens of thousands were choking with the most shocking convulsions. And my grandfather writes, his brother turns to him and he says, my entire abrida, please, I would like to ask for some water. My grandfather responded, it's better without water. This way death will relieve us of our pain sooner. We were inches and moments from the next world. But, but a heavenly miracle occurred. Standing at the threshold of death, an SS officer comes, grabbed my grandfather and his brother by their hair, yanked them out. He said, you're capable of work. And he dragged them away. This godly wonder will remain in our memories forever, writes my grandfather. Where was the rebunish song during the Holocaust? Well, just as you had the two Kruven and the Chorben that embraced each other, that even at a time of great Hester Panim, there was a certain Gile, there was a certain divine revelation. The Rebunisham was standing at the threshold of the crematoria and pulled my grandfather out. But then a very simple thought occurred to me. It wasn't only my grandfather that the Rebunisham pulled out of the crematoria. Because had the Rebunisham not saved him, I would not be here today. I would not be. The Rebbe Hashem rescued my grandfather from the crematoria. The Rebbe Hashem rescued my father. The Rebbe Hashem rescued me. The Rebbe Hashem rescued my children. He saved us. I guess the Rebbe Hashem wanted us. He must have wanted us. And you know something? If you are in this room today, the Rebbe Shalom rescued you too. The Rebbe Shalom has been looking out for you for a very long time. You know, people say, if only I would see an open miracle, if only I would see the splitting of the sea, then I would really have a muna. You want to see a miracle? Look around this room today. Look at the face of another Yid. A yid in 2016 is the biggest mess you will ever see. If only you understood how long the Rebbe Hashem has been looking out for you. 3,300 years ago in Mitzrayim, 80% of Klal Yisrael perished. But the Rebbe Hashem saved your direct ancestor so that you could be here today. 
Chorben Ma'is Rishain. The death toll was enormous. But the Rebansha wanted you. So he made sure your ancestors made it through Ma'is Rishain. Chorben Ma'is Sheni, Josephus writes, the death toll was 1.1 million. 97,000 Jews were taken captive. But your direct ancestors made it through Chorben Ma'is Sheni. Otherwise you wouldn't be here today. Crusades, thousands of Jews massacred. 1391, 200,000 Jews converted to Christianity. 1492, tens of thousands killed. 300,000 Jews expelled. But your direct ancestors were saved. Otherwise you wouldn't be here. Chalmanitsky pogroms. The Rebbeim has been looking out for you for 3,300 years. Your immediate ancestors made it through the Holocaust. For a Jew to be here today, it's not statistically unlikely, it's not highly improbable, it's downright impossible. It's an open miracle of the highest proportions. Says of Yaakov Enden in his introduction to the Siddur, how can the heretic not be ashamed by analyzing our situation in the world? After everything that has been transpired over the last thousands of years, Chai nafshi, says of Yaakov Emdin, I swear. Ki behis boinini bin aflai seira. That when I think about these wonders, Godoy etzlo yoser mikol nisim bin aflai sh'osa Hashem yisbarach la'avoseinu bin Mitzrayim. You know, we say in Eicha, Tisha B'Av is a noyed. What kind of noyed is it? like to suggest if Pesach is a Moyed to commemorate Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim then Tisha B'Av is a much greater Moyed to commemorate a miracle much greater than Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim to commemorate the miracle of the existence of Klai Yisrael today and as every Tisha B'Av passes the Moyed of Tisha B'Av compounds and is much greater and just imagine if Rabbi Yaakov Emden was astonished by the wonder of a Jew in the 18th century. Can we even begin to imagine what would Rabbi Yaakov Emden say if he saw a Yid today? What kind of miracle would he describe it as? Maybe he would say, it's a Ness, She'en kol ma'ach ubeyo yecholam l'shar. And think about it. The greatest miracle in the history of the world the Rebbein Shalom made for you. Because the Rebbein Shalom wanted your Torah and your Mitzvahs and your Tefillah and your Tefillin and your Kinnis. The Rebbein Shalom saved you from Mitzrayim, Bayis Rishon, Bayis Sheni, Crusades, Pogroms, the gas chambers. Just so you can do Torah Mitzvahs. Can any generation cry out to Rebbeinu Shalom greater than ours? Ahava Rabba Ahavtanu Hashem Elekeinu Chemla Gidoyla Vusira Chamalta Aleinu And perhaps we could be so daring and so bold to suggest and we often wonder and the Chafetz Chaim raises the question that how in our lowly generation how are we going to bring Mashiach? Moshe Rabbeinu, David HaMelech, Rashi, Vilna Gain, Chafetz Chaim. And we, Aniyah Aniyim, Yasmi the Yasmi, orphaned from Torah, completely bereft of Ruchnias. Are you kidding me? If they couldn't do it, how are we going to do it? Can we be so daring to say, no, 
We have the koyach. We have the power. Because never has a yid had more value in the eyes of the Rebbeinu Shalom than a yid today. You know how many miracles the Rebbeinu Shalom had to perform so that you could be here? The Rebbeinu Shalom has a lot invested in you. The Rebbeinu Shalom invests in a yid today more than ever in history. Why us? We don't know why. But one thing we know, he wants us. He wants our tefillah. He wants our Torah. He wants our zechusim. He wants us to be the ones to cry out to bring Mashiach. So while we sit on the floor and we mourn and we cry, Tisha B'Av, our hearts are ennobled, our hearts are aflame because we've been entrusted with the most important job in the history of Kal Yisrael. So Tisha B'Av is not only a day of tragedy, not only a day of mourning, Tisha B'Av is a moyed. Zeicher! Lemitzchiyas Yisrael! It's a zeicher to the eternity of Kal Yisrael. And there is no greater moyed than that. Allow me to direct your attention to Noyach. Noach comes out of the Teva. The whole world was destroyed. Mankind perished. The animals, the fish, the birds, they're all gone. And he comes out of the Teva. And what's the very first thing that Noach does when he comes out of the Teva? Pasuk says, Ayita Karem, he planted a vineyard. And Rashi says from Chazal that Noach was criticized for planting a vineyard. He should have planted something else. He should have planted grain. What's the taina on Noach? What's wrong with planting a vineyard? Noach sees a world destroyed, mankind decimated. Noach is marvelous. He's mourning. What do you give a downtrodden person to drink? What does it say in Mishlei? Peraklam and Aleph. Tenu sheicha lo'oyved v'yayin l'moyin nefesh. Noach was merely consoling himself, comforting himself. What's the time on Noach? Says of Simcha Wasserman, Zechatzak Levracha. Noach comes out of the Teva. He looks around, he sees utter devastation, complete destruction. Now is not the time to, see, to feel fa- sorry for yourself. Now is not the time to comfort yourself, to console yourself. Now's the time to get up, to roll up your sleeves, pick yourself off the floor, dust yourself off, get up and build for the future. There's no time to wallow in self-pity. There's a world to build. Noah, plant grain for the future. Noah is criticized for his attitude. We don't allow ourselves the luxury of feeling sorry for ourselves. We pick ourselves off the floor and we build for the future. I believe this has to serve as an important model of how we react and how we recover in generations after the Holocaust. We don't wallow in self-pity. We don't feel sorry for ourselves. But like Chazal say to Noyach, we pick ourselves off the floor, we roll up our sleeves, and we focus our efforts on building for the future. What did my grandfather do after the Holocaust? He didn't waste a day. In his capacity as the head of the religious department of the joint, and with his connections to General Eisenhower, my grandfather had shipped into the DP camps, Tashmishe Mitzvah, Tashmishe Kedusha, Talesim, Tfilin, Shefaros, Dalad Minim, I could show you pictures of my grandfather distributing Dalad Minim, Matzos, Svarim. I brought with me today. There were no Svarim in the camps. My grandfather published the first two Svarim in the DP camps. The Evan Shlema of the Goyim, the Lev David of the Chida. You could see it's in the army green. These are the first Svarim published in the DP camps. I want to read to you briefly a letter of Hananiah Yom Tov Goldman, who writes, thanking my grandfather for his efforts when my grandfather finally left, left Europe. You can't even believe such a thing. 
He writes, V'achar Omo V'yagir Rabba After much effort, sweat and toil, Ola B'yadoy Livnois Mikvois My grandfather built Mikvois in every DP camp. L'yasei Moistois Torah Yeshivois After being an eyewitness to the greatest disaster at least in recent history, my grandfather could have folded his hands and planted the proverbial vineyard, sipping the wine of consolation. But that's not how a Jew reacts to tragedy. Even on Tisha B'Av, we get off the floor, we dust ourselves off, we roll up our sleeves, and we think, what could we do to build for the future? And when my grandfather considered his most sacred task and his most rewarding task was if he was able to find anybody who had a relative either in America or Canada or in Eretz Yisrael, if you had a relative in another country, you'd be able to get visas, passports, and rebuild your life. And until recently, we, we were not even aware of how many individuals, how many families my grandfather helped relocate after the war. And we asked my grandfather, Zayda, now how many people did you help? He didn't want to say, my grandmother, Zogazunsan, said, Zaydi helped thousands of survivors relocate after the war, come to America, come to Canada, come to Eretz Yisrael. And I recently discovered in an old edition of Dasir de Shavart that one of the great individuals my grandfather helped relocate and come to America was none other than the Kleisenberger Rebbe. And this is what we do on Tisha B'Av. Yes, last night we cried, this morning we sit on the floor, but now it's time to get up. And we think to ourselves, what are we going to do? We don't sit and drink the wine of consolation as Noach was criticized by Yitah Koran. But we get off the floor and we dust ourselves off and we think to ourselves, what could we do to build Torah? What could we do to mechazek our families, to mechazek Klal Yisrael, to bring more Yidin back to Torah mitzvahs? That's the avoid of Tisha B'av. If I could share with you one last story. My grandfather was together with his brother, Henoch, Uncle Henoch, all the years. And in all the camps, they were Moser Nefesh as much as possible to try to be Mekayim as many mitzvahs. In one particular death camp, which was under the direction of a most brutal lager fuhrer, a Russia by the name of Phaikis, Yemach Shemai, my grandfather and his brother were successful in smuggling in a pair of tefillin. Every morning at the crack of dawn, they would wake up and put on the tefillin. First my grandfather and then his brother. One morning, my grandfather put on the tefillin, the shayad, the shayrosh, and then he gave it to his brother, Uncle Henoch. Uncle Henoch puts on the tefillin shayad. And I heard this story from my grandfather many years ago, I heard it from Uncle Henoch. Uncle Henoch puts on the tefillin shayrosh. Just then, Phaikis barges in. He sees the tefillin shayrosh perched on the head of this tzaddik. The Nazi is startled, he put his gun down and he ran out. The Pachad. My grandfather writes, of course, this is a fulfillment of the Pasuk, Ro Karami Aoretz, Kishem Hashem, Nikra Alecha, Yorim Mecca, says the Gemara Ilu, Tfilin Shabarosh. One final thought. After the war ended, the Holocaust was over. My grandfather was interviewed by the secular media and it's recorded in a book called After the Holocaust. He said, Rabbi, after being an eyewitness to the brutality of the Germans, you saw your brothers and your sisters, your father and your mother massacred. Did you at any point lose faith in your God? Lose faith in the promises of the Torah? And my grandfather responded, did I lose faith? Yes, I lost faith. I lost faith in man. I lost faith in humanity. How could human beings become animals, barbarians? 
How could civilized societies turn the other way, including our very own Golden Medina? How could they stick their heads in the sand and make believe nothing was happening? So yes, did I lose faith? I lost faith in man. But never even for a moment did I lose faith in my God. Did I lose faith in my Torah? My faith in God only became stronger. Who can fathom the deep-seated amuna of these giants of spirit? And this is one of the messages we give over to our children. That a yid never loses faith. A yid is never miyayish. And maybe this is another reason why Tisha B'Av is a moyed. It's a celebration of the unbending, unwavering amuna of Klai Yisrael, no matter what we've endured. Remember one time after Yom Tif, I asked my grandfather, "No, Zaidi, how was Yom Tif? Yom Tif. It was beautiful. And then he said, like he says every year, now I'm just waiting for the Gula Shalema. Now anyone could say the words, but he said the words like you would order something, forgive the, exp- the masha, like you would order something from Amazon, and they tell you it's coming either Monday or Tuesday. And on Monday you're waiting 50-50, maybe it's coming today. That's how he yearns for the Geula. After seeing the greatest devastation that happened to our people, he emerged with ironclad Amuna, Amuna Chushis, Amuna in the coming of the Geula. May the Rav give us all Kayach, Siyata Deshmaya, to come together, to rebuild, to restore the glory of our people. Haramas Karen Yisrael, Haramas Karen Atora. May you all see the Nachamas Siyah in Yushalayim. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.